right, good morning. Welcome to St. Mark's United Methodist Church. I'm Dan, one of the pastors here. Glad you are here with us today. Uh, hopefully you dodged the raindrops on your way in. And uh, it does look like it's going to be a little bit rainy today. I want to let you know that we are still having our back-to-school bash. It's going to just be probably inside in the dock. Uh, you probably also saw the tent out here. So as long as it's not like raining sideways, that should help. Uh, so we'll have Kona Ice and the Bookmobile be here. And then we're going to have inflatables inside the dock. It's going to be really fun. So if you've got some kids, grandkids, neighbor kids, bring them out. Uh, it's going to be a great time. Kids are going back to school on Tuesday. Hallelujah. And uh, so uh, we are going to be celebrating together today. Would love for you to grab your Connect card out of your bulletin and fill that out. Whether you're here for the first time or you've been here for years, uh, you can put that in the offering plate when it goes by in a little while, along with any offering you might have. If you're joining us online, there are uh, links in the comment section for you to be able to give online and also to fill out an online Connect card. So uh, we hope that you will make use of those things. I want to let you know about a few things that are coming up. Uh, so one of them is this Wednesday, Grief Share is starting. If you have not yet signed up and you'd like to participate, there is still time. Uh, you can just mark that on your Connect card. This is a great opportunity for anyone who's uh, really kind of struggling going through uh, some loss or, uh, or grief in any other way. Uh, we would love for you to come and join us. There's a morning session and an evening session. Uh, if you have any questions about that, feel free to let me know. Uh, you can, um, and you can call the office if you have any questions. We want to be able to help you out through that. Next Sunday, I've been announcing this for several weeks, but I want to let you know uh, that it's coming next Sunday is our sermon called Hope Lives Here. And uh, we're going to be talking uh, at both services about the topic of Christianity and suicide. Uh, so I just wanted to give you a heads up that that's coming, if that's something that's going to be a little difficult for you to hear. Um, just wanted to make sure that you're not surprised when you come, uh, but maybe it's something that you feel like could be really, really important for you, for someone that you know. So we'd love for you to invite them to come in uh, for some of that conversation. We'll be hearing some stories and some, some things from uh, some people in our community who work with folks in the mental health services, and uh, they'll be sharing with us a little bit. On Monday night, the 29th, uh, we'll be having at 6.30 in the dock an event that is a suicide survivors panel. Uh, it's for people who uh, maybe they themselves have experienced thoughts around suicide. They've had family members that they've lost to suicide. Uh, they work with people who, have, who um, um, are, are struggling with mental health issues. And so it'll be some great conversation. It's such an important topic here in our community. Um, I, I've done more funerals than I want to um, uh, the, uh, from people who have lost their lives to suicide, and it's something that's kind of hidden sometimes. So I think it's important for us to talk about. We'd love for you to come out to that. Uh, and then coming in the future on September 10th at 4 in the afternoon, we'll have a, uh, another uh, discussion in the dock, and that'll be especially for families and teens and youth. And so, um, again, if you know some folks that this could be important for, please feel free to share this information with them. Um, on uh, September 14th, we're going to be starting some new stuff on Wednesday nights. And uh, so there's going to be several things going on, really, for all ages. Spark Kids will be coming back on September 14th. I, I think all this is at 6.30 in the evening. Uh, Spark Kids will be coming back for... For all of our kiddos, they're going to be able to hang out. It'll be over in the dock. It'll be a really good time of some games and Bible stories and, and lessons like that. Our youth will be starting back up, and they're going to be meeting on Wednesday nights now at the same time. And then we're also going to have St. Mark's University, where we're going to offer for, for any of you all who are interested. It'll be really kind of like a college-level course that we're going to be, uh, that I'll be teaching. Um, we're going to start this first semester uh, is uh, Intro to the Bible kind of course. And so we'll be talking a lot about the, the origins of the Bible, where, the, where Scripture comes from, how we read Scripture, um, and really kind of dive into some of those details of that. So if that's something that you are interested in, uh, just mark that on your Connect card. And if you've got questions, I'll be happy to answer any questions uh, for you. It's free. Um, we just want you to come and uh, learn a little bit more about the Bible. So 
Lots going on. There's even more than that that I, that I didn't mention, but hopefully you got the newsletter. If you didn't, there's copies back there. Also, if you didn't get a t-shirt last week and you want one, there's still some t-shirts back there. Uh, you can stop at the Connection Center after the service and grab one of those. Friends, God is in this place, and we are so glad that you are here to worship with us today. Sister Eleanor, would you please prepare our hearts and minds for worship? Good morning. Please stand if you're able and join me with the call to worship. And remain standing after that to join me in singing the opening hymn, Only Trust Him, on page 337 in your hymnal or follow the words on the screens. We believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. We believe in the Holy Spirit, who guides and speaks to us still. We believe, O Lord, help our unbelief. Fill this place with your Spirit once again. Truth, the way that leads you into 
trust him, only trust him now. He will save you, he will save you, he will save you now. Come then and join this holy band and on to glory go. seated. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you once again for the privilege of entering your house to worship you. There is no place that we would rather be and no privilege that is greater than to enter your courts with thanksgiving and praise. How beautiful and how unfathomable that the author of the universe would allow us into his presence that we might be able to proclaim your majesty and goodness in our lives. Thank you for your grace, and thank you for seeing us and caring for us. We confess today that we have not been everything you have created us to be. We have sinned and fallen short of your glory. We have turned our backs on those who need to experience your love, and we have done harm to brother, sister, and neighbor and we have help us to turn back to you as we repent of our sin. Give us the strength and courage to serve you with our whole hearts. Heal us where we are broken and in pain, and pour your mercy upon us, that we might share your same love with the world. And in all things we will give you praise, as we pray all of this in the strong name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now let us give back to God out of what he has greatly given to us.
Gracious God, today we recognize your goodness in our lives. You have given us many gifts, and it is our honor to return a portion of what you have given to us back to you, so that the blessings may be multiplied. May these gifts further your kingdom, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated.
Thank you, Steve. I, I told him I'd read scripture for him since, you know, he's doing everything else in this service today. So, uh, and we appreciate you very much. Our scripture today is from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. And it says this, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the place where I am going. Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. We're wrapping up our series today called Bring Your Doubts. We've been exploring the, the topic of doubt, that, you know, sometimes we, we do find ourselves having, having doubts and that, you know, that's, that's an okay thing as long as we don't just stay in that place, as long as we try to wrestle with those things and, and learn and grow a little bit deeper. We started off just talking about the idea of doubts and whether or not there is a God and, uh, and, and how those doubts can sometimes creep in. Last week, we talked about the doubts that can come from unanswered prayers, especially as it relates to those innocents in our lives and, and how we can move through those things. And today, we're going to be exploring one of the other things that, um, that a recent uh, study, a recent survey of American Christians showed is one of the leading causes of doubt for many people. And that's the idea around world religions as they relate to Christianity. Uh, this is a huge area uh, for many that causes them to doubt. I have had multiple people ask me questions about this over the years and even recently. Um, things like, I just don't see how a loving God would send a Hindu or a Buddhist to hell just because they were born in a different culture and religion and didn't accept Jesus. That just doesn't make sense to me. I've, I've heard that over and over again. So we're going we're gonna to talk about that today. I'm, I'm guessing maybe a lot of you have had doubts along these lines, and so I thought it would be an important conversation for us to have. Now, I want to be very clear again, as I've told you throughout the series, I don't have all of the answers. Um, I'm just sharing with you a little bit how I've been able to reconcile these things in my life and in my faith and uh, how, you know, some other people, uh, Christians that we have leaned on through the ages, um, how they've thought about these things, and, and how I've moved through these places where I've experienced, uh, where I've experienced doubt. So, um, around 40,000 years ago, anthropologists and archaeologists will tell you, uh, there is uh, evidence in the fossil record that uh, humans— began developing religious thoughts and practices. Um, there's you know, evidence that, to suggest that humans had begun thinking about an afterlife and what that looks like. They can tell that, I guess, from uh, burial customs and, and the, those kinds of things. Not that they've found, like, you know, super old manuscripts or anything, but, but just from some of the fossil record and thing they found, they think, you know, it seems like it was a long, long time ago that humans began thinking about and in some way um, understanding that there is an afterlife, maybe that there is something divine, that there is a God. Now, Jesus showed up on earth about 2,000 years ago. So what was happening between the time when um, humans began to think and recognize that there's an afterlife, that there is a God, uh, who created and exists in some way and began yearning after God. What was happening in that time? Uh, it, it seems like God was content in some ways to let us humans figure it out on our own, to, to grapple with these things without giving us all of the answers uh, right away, right? And, and that's hard for us to understand. Uh, we are getting into this time of year. Tuesday is, is the day for my family 
where kids go back to school, which also means that uh, we're going to begin the period of time where in the evening, uh, kids are sitting at the kitchen counter and uh, they're doing homework and um, they're asking for, for help uh, with math and, and other things. And my first instinct is to just give them the answer so I can go to bed uh, because I don't want to do this anymore. I already went to school. I don't want to do homework anymore. So like that's my first instinct is to just get it done. But I know that they don't learn anything that way. And, and so they've got to they've be able to wrestle with it. They've got to be able to learn. So I can't just give them all the answers. They need to figure it out and learn it themselves. And in some ways, that's kind of what God has done with us. He gave us evidence in creation of who God is, things that would cause us to look and to see and say, ah, oh, okay, there's something bigger at play here. And, um, and he gave us experiences with the divine in, in ways, uh, you know, through prayer and through other things that, that caused us to know more about God and to learn more about God. Um, and, and it seems as if for a long time, God wasn't so concerned with whether or not we got it all right or, or figured it all out. And by the way, we still haven't figured God out, okay? We are, we are never going to be at the point where we have fully understood God, we, we just, our three pounds of gray matter between our ears can't comprehend the God of the universe. It's just not, not possible. Um, but we've, we've learned more, and, and we've grown in this more. So in all of this, what happened is humanity began developing religions, trying to put into words and practice what they were experiencing with the divine. We were trying to capture who God is in, in ritual and in, and in practice, and and some of them were maybe closer to right, and some of them were, were farther away, and some of them were like way off uh, and, and not reflective of who God is at all. And here's where I find the Apostle Paul to be really, really helpful uh, to me. Uh, because in uh, Acts 17, the Apostle Paul goes to Athens, and he's uh, at the Acropolis. It's a place where there's temples to just all these different Greek gods and, and all of these pagan temples and all of these things. And, um, and it's on the top of Mars Hill in, in Athens. And Paul begins to speak to the council. And here's what he says. I, I love just picturing him there amongst all of these different religions and, and different uh, temples and things. And here's what Paul says. People of Athens, I see that in every way, you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. What you worship as unknown, I now proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that we, I love this, so that we would seek him and perhaps reach out and find him, though he is not far from any of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. I, I just, I love the picture of Paul saying that in this place. Paul's making it clear that God created all of them, all of us. We are all his offspring and that God wanted us to search for him and find him. And he was leaving, and God was leaving hints that he was around that we might find him. And, and he's not far from any of us. And then he quotes their own poets and philosophers who were talking about Zeus um, and, but he takes those words and he applies them to God, to Yahweh. And not, not that Zeus and God are the same, but that the, Greco, the Greco-Roman people, they didn't know it. But when they thought they were crying out to Zeus, 
Perhaps they were actually crying out to God. We are all God's offspring. God seems to care about people, not just the Jewish people and the Christian people, but God seemed to care about people of all nations and all religions. He sent Jonah to preach to the Ninevites who worship the god Ishtar um, and, and preaches repentance to them. He, he chooses the Magi to be some of the first to come and to worship the Christ child. They were likely Zoroastrian priests, right? And, and, and they've come to worship the Christ child. And he tells the Israelites that they are meant to be a light to the nations, to all nations. So in this, religion becomes a lens through which we see God. And some religions maybe help us see God more clearly than others. You've, you've probably been to the eye doctor before, and they've used a phoropter. Do you know what a phoropter is? It's the thing that they put up to your face, and then they say, better one or two. Right? And they, they do all the little lenses and all the different things so you can try to see uh, what, what helps you see more clearly. And when they first do it, they distort your vision on purpose. It's worse than if you had no glasses at all. And that's what bad religion can be like sometimes. A, a, a bad religion can really distort the image of, of who God is, you know. Um, some people will say that all religions are the same. They're not. Some lead to oppression and harm and abuse and, 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 and some terrible things, and they distort the image of God. And there are certain religions that seem to lend themselves towards that, towards distorting the image of God. So, no, they're not all equally valid because some are doing incredible harm. And we're not all saying the same things. We're saying some, some different things. We're not all headed the same direction. And... And some say some similar things, but not totally the same thing. And some point us to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And religion at its best helps us to see God most clearly. And for me, as I've, as I've studied world religions, and I've met different people from different places, and I've, I've traveled uh, to several different continents and, and experience different things with different people, the one who helps me see God most clearly is Jesus Christ, crystal clearly. Paul says in Colossians that the Son is the image of the invisible God. And Jesus himself says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and the Father are one. So when Jesus came down, Jesus didn't give us, didn't come down and hand us a book. He came down as a person, and he showed us this is God in the flesh. This is what God is like. So for me, I see God most clearly, and I think we can see God most clearly through the person of Jesus Christ. Now, the truth is that a Muslim would say, I see God most clearly through Islam. Or a Hindu would say, I, through Hinduism. And, and I recognize we all have different lenses we're seeing through. But for me, when I look at the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, I can't help but most clearly see the God of the universe who created us and loves us. And so that leads to the question... That, that is really a struggle for many people. Does that mean that my Muslim or Hindu or Buddhist friends, that they are going to burn forever in hell because, because they, they are a part of a different religion? Are they lost for all eternity? I, I think it's a thing that a lot of people just really struggle with. So 1 Timothy chapter 2 gives us a, a, what might be a good hint to how it is that God sees us and acts. It says this, that God, our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth, for there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. So God's desire is that we would all come to know him, that all people would come to know him. And, and then here's this idea that what Jesus has done to save humanity, he did once and for all in his life, death, and resurrection, so that this salvation is available to all through 
Christ. And we know that, that if we accept that, you know, Christ as our Savior, that our salvation is secure. We accept the gift God has given us. But what about the people who don't know that? Who can't see clearly through that lens or, or don't know to see clearly through that lens? What Scripture tells us is that the price has already been paid by Jesus. And what many believe is that God can apply that saving work of Jesus to the account of anyone he chooses to, based on what he sees of their own heart. And in some ways, we, you know, we already believe that, right? We talk about children who, who die before uh, they're, they're at an age where they can have a chance to come and know and understand Jesus. And we believe that his redeeming work on the cross is available to them. And we believe that his grace is sufficient for someone who doesn't have the mental capabilities to, to understand uh, God. Or, you know, we talk about there's always like the instance of like there's that lost tribe that hasn't been contacted by the outside world yet. And, and, and what happens with them if they've never had the chance to, to hear and to, and to know Jesus? So is it perhaps possible that there are people who love God with all their heart and who love their neighbors as themselves, that God would see their heart and say, you were yearning for Jesus, you just didn't know it. Now, you might be surprised to know that this is actually the official view of the Catholic Church, of most, if not all, mainline Protestant denominations. It's the view of theologians like John Wesley and, and C.S. Lewis and Justin Martyr. C.S. Lewis said it this way in, um, in his epic, The Last Battle. Um, if, if you ever get a chance to read some of the Chronicles of Narnia stuff, it's not just kids' books. It's like there's some theology in there. And so the way that he talks about it is this. There's, there's two opposing figures. There's Aslan, the lion, who's representative, uh, representative of Jesus. And then there's Tash, who is the representative of everything evil and bad in the world. And um, in the last battle, there is a protagonist who is um, on the side of Tash, actually, or, or so he thinks. And finally, when he gets to the throne room, he sees that it's not Tash on the throne, it's actually Aslan. And he, his heart sinks because he knows he's, he's in trouble. But Aslan says to him, no, come on in. You are a child of mine. And here's, here's how this conversation goes then after that. The man says, Lord, is it then true that you and Tash are one? And the lion growled so that the earth shook and said, it is false. Not because he and I are one, but because we are opposites. I take to me the services which you have done for him. For I and he are of such different kinds that no service which is vile can be done for me, and none that is not vile can be done for him. Therefore, if any man swear by Tash and keep his oath for the oath's sake, it is by me that he is truly sworn, though he knew it not, and it's I who reward him. And if any man do cruelty in my name, then though he says the name Aslan, it's Tash, whom he's really serving. But then I said, the man says, I've been seeking Tash all my days. And the beloved, and beloved said the glorious one, said Aslan, unless your desire had been for me, you wouldn't have sought so long and so truly. For all find what they truly seek. So a couple of points here. First, C.S. Lewis is way smarter than me. Uh, number two is that it, it's pointing towards something about the grace of Jesus that we have a hard time comprehending. That what if there are those who might be following Jesus and just don't know to call upon his name? Now, I want you to understand I am a Christian, and I believe with all my heart that when my earthly eyes close for the last time and I find myself in heaven, I'm going to see Jesus face to face. 
And I believe that there will likely be people of all sorts of other religions that when they find themselves in heaven, they will open their eyes and they will see Jesus face to face. And it may be that Jesus will say, or that they will say to Jesus, it was you I was seeking all along and didn't know it. I'm not sure. I, I could be way off on this, but I think this could be how God would choose to pour out his grace through Jesus. Now, here's what there's absolutely no question of. Jesus calls us to love our neighbors and even our enemies. We are called to love, and that includes people of different faiths, Muslim, Hindu, agnostic, atheist. We're called to love. And we may see God in slightly different or sometimes extremely different ways, but often there are things we can agree on, that we are called to love, do acts of charity and mercy, and offer grace and peace to one another. And I want to be very clear about something else, because I'm sure there's some of you squirming in your seats. I fully believe that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. The only way. He's very clear about this, right? That no one comes to the Father except by me. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And where I think maybe we sometimes slip up is, is when we are deciding who has access to that and how we gain access to Jesus and how we acquire the salvation. I grew up, like many of you perhaps, in a church where um, almost every Sunday at my church growing up, we had an altar call. And, uh, and you had to go up and you had to get saved. I got saved dozens of times at that altar. And um, it, it went up and you had to say the sinner's prayer. And actually, uh, our pastor for a little while had a very specific version of the sinner's prayer we had to say. If you didn't mention the blood of Jesus, it didn't count, right? Like if you didn't mention the blood, it was somehow like, mm, you're wrong. And, and so, like, so I prayed it several ways. I made sure I said it using uh, King James language, just in case that was the only way God could hear it. Um, like, I, I, was, I, I did every way that I could think of. Um, but here's the thing. The sinner's prayer, the, that, that prayer that, that I said, and that so many of you, that most of us in this room probably have, have said at some point in our life for our, for our salvation, that came from the book Pilgrim's Progress in the 17th century. This is, this is a newer-ish uh, kind of prayer. And before that, many Christians uh, had this idea that the way in which you, you gain the favor and grace of Jesus is by giving alms to the church or, um, or through participating in the sacraments in some way. Or the earliest Christians uh, showed their devotion through being baptized in Jesus' names in Jewish mikvahs. Uh, in these, in these um, baptismal pools that, that people had. Because you, in the earliest, earliest days, you had to be, Christianity was a part of what it meant to be Jewish for some people. Uh, that these two were in, in, intertwined in some way. All this to say the means by which we have sought after and seek to gain salvation through Jesus, it's changed over the years and over the centuries. Denominations have split over who they thought was doing it right and who, who believed they had the real gospel. I've got the real gospel, right? Who's really in and who's really out. And we have drawn very permanent lines in the sand. But here's what I have come to believe. The more I've gotten to know God and the heart of God is through Jesus, is that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And that the scripture tells us that it's not God's desire that any should perish. And the God I know, who loves us all deeply, can count the hairs on each of our heads and it isn't keeping people out on technicalities, but I believe Jesus is trying to save people by any means necessary. We have this like uh, image in our mind, it's in one of the grief share videos, if you, if you ever participate in that, of, uh, of like there's a big boat as if God is keeping people off the boat who don't belong on the lifeboat. Instead, God is reaching down with every hand he has to pull as many, grabbing them by the hair, whatever it takes, getting them on. Get on the boat, you know? I want you, I want you in. And one of the images that I use with people a lot, probably because I have kids, and this is just um, where my analogies come from. Have you seen the Disney movie Aladdin? Uh, I don't know if you've seen that, that cartoon. You can go home and watch it, you know, this evening or something like that if it's raining. Um, 
But there's a scene where Aladdin has his hands tied and he's thrown into the ocean uh, to drown. And the lamp falls out of his turban and it hits his hand. And Aladdin's gagged underwater and, and the lamp hits his hand and the genie comes out and um, sees that Aladdin is, is drowning, sees that he's in trouble. And he says to him, I can't just save you. You have to say, genie, I want you to save me. And Aladdin, unconscious, bobs his head in the water. And he says, I'll take that as a yes. And he grabs him and saves him and pulls him out of there. And I wonder if that same kind of grace isn't the kind of grace that God pours out on us. I'll take that as a yes. Like, I, I kind of feel like maybe that's a part of how God works. I'm not a universalist. I just happen to worship the God of the universe. And I believe life in Jesus gives you the clearest vision of who God truly is. He is the image of the invisible God. I don't worship him for who he keeps out. I worship him for his amazing grace, for how wide and long and high and deep his love truly is. And I could be way off. I'm just saying I've seen the kind of grace God pours out, and I wouldn't put it past God to save more people than I think deserve to be saved. He has a tendency to do that. There's a great story in, um, in Acts chapter 10 where Cornelius, who's this, who's this kind of semi-pagan, not sure what he is, Gentile, hears this voice that he thinks might be God who says, you need to reach out to a man named Peter. And Peter reluctantly goes to this man's house because this is a Gentile. He's a Jew. He's not supposed to even have conversation with them. They're wrong in every way, shape, and form. And they are a different kind of person. They're the wrong religion. They're the wrong everything. And Cornelius says to, to Peter, you know, I've, I've experienced who I think is the God that you're talking about. And he said that I'm supposed to talk to you because you've got the words of life. And Peter says this, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. And he goes on to tell them about Jesus, and he baptizes them. And the Holy Spirit comes on the whole house. God's Spirit is doing work in people that nobody thought the Holy Spirit was allowed to work in. And Peter goes back to Jerusalem, and the Jews had heard about what happened, and they said, what are you doing? You can't eat in that guy's house. Don't you know what those people are like? They're, they're way off. They're not like us. They're not in. And Peter explains and says, listen, God is working in them. They were seeking after God. They just didn't know it. They were seeking after Jesus. They just didn't know it. And when I told them, the Holy Spirit came pouring upon them. And this is what they said. It said, when they heard this, well, first Peter says this, and I love this line. So if God gave them the same gift he gave us who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could stand in God's way? Which I really like that. And when they heard this, they had no further objections, and they praised God, saying, so, then even to Gentiles, even to them, even to Gentiles, has God granted the repentance that leads to life. Friends, we are followers of a real big God. We are followers of Jesus, and his desire is that everyone would come to know just how much he loves them. And I'm so glad that through the lens of Jesus, I can see God most clearly. And I see his amazing grace that saved even a wretch like me. Even though I once was lost, he found me. He found me as a little boy laying in bed one night after vacation Bible school, remembering something that my teacher had said, and I just prayed these six words. Jesus, come into my heart. Amen. And it's through this Jesus that I have come to see the God of the universe more clearly and just how wide 
and long and high and deep his love for all of us truly is. And so it's this grace and this promise of resurrection, this promise that the worst thing is never the last thing, that Jesus really came and lived and died and rose again and has a place for me in his kingdom, and that someday when I die, I will see Jesus face to face. It's all of this that I believe. And I don't just believe it. I'm counting on it. And I believe you can count on it too. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you that your grace is wider than ours is. That your love is stronger than ours is. That your reach is farther than ours is. And we pray that you would give us your eyes to see others the way you see them. We thank you for coming, for living and walking among us, for dying on the cross for us, for rising from the dead for us, defeating death so that we might be with you forever. And we know that it's going to be a party someday, and we are so thankful. We are so thankful that you reach out with your arms towards the nations. Help us to reach out in the same way to show others more clearly just how truly, deeply God loves them. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Friends, as you are able, would you stand and join us for our closing hymn. Friends, I hope to see you back here at 2 today for a little bit of a shindig, a little bit of a party, and we'll have a great time together. And as you go out from this place today, I pray that God gives you faith and that Christ gives you peace and the Holy Spirit gives you the power to share this gospel, this good news of God's perfect love. Amen.